I came from Spain. I'm really excited to be here in New York, Caroline's in Broadway, talking about Grilla Yao, which is a really great spec. I guess most of you will love it, but I will show you today. And, and that's also a, a little bit more about me. I'm like a kind of aware fish in this, in this conference because I'm not working in front end at all. I don't write websites. I don't write CSS all the day. Uh, I'm on the other side. I'm working exactly on the browser. I'm implementing the CSS really large the spec on Blink and WebKit, so in Chromium and on future, future Safari versions. So I'm like a different position than most of you, but it's really good that you know how this is working and how you can also contact with us and with the CSS working group people like Leah in order to move the specs forward and contribute to them because like Leah said yesterday, you have a lot of power in what things are going to happen in the browsers. So even if you don't know it, you can do noise, you can ping people, and, and things will, will get modified. And I'm part of an open source consultancy from Spain called Igalia that was funded back in 2001. And we work mostly on free software projects. We have people all around the globe. And we have a pretty big uh, web platform team with a lot of experience in, in WebKit and also in Chromium and even in Servo. So we collaborate in different free software projects. So here we are going to talk about layout on the web. And I guess most of you know how to do websites. So most of you know that most of the websites are using somehow a Google layout. You usually have a header. You usually have a footer, maybe a column on the left or on the right. So there are grids everywhere. This is just one example, the New York, New York Times website, where you have a footer, you have a column on the left. And grids have been there forever. I mean, if we go back in time to 1996, we see that the grid, uh, the New York Times website was already using a grid somehow, some columns, some foot, some header. So how does this, this evolve? You know better than me. It's part of the history, but people started to use tables. I guess some of you, or most of you, use a table the first time you create a website. You shouldn't be ashamed about because of that, because I guess <laughs> that's what, what all of us have done sometime. And then, we have floats, and floats work really nice if you want to float an image on the left and the text flowing on the right. But when you try to create really complex layouts and you want to have columns and you want maybe to have rows and span two rows, then things become more complex. The same happens with inline blocks that are good for some use cases but not for a complete grid design. And then the CSS frameworks emerge, and they are pretty good. There are some of them that do a lot of nice things. The problem is that there are so many that it's hard to see what's the good one. You can choose one, and then you realize that you miss a feature. And maybe changing the whole website to, any, to another framework is not an option anymore. And also, you have to download the CSS or JavaScript sometime in, in your page. So it's not like the perfect solution. It's a good solution anyway. And then from the W3C, uh, uh, especially from the CSS working group, new specs are appearing. One of them is CSS Flexible Box that I guess several of you have already used it or have already played with it, which is a really great spec, but it's thought for one-dimensional layout. So if you want to put elements in, in a row and use this, this space properly and flex some of them that once grow more than other, and then if there are no displays, they wrap to the next line. So that works pretty good in flexible, Flexbox. But if you want to do a complete layout of your web page, like a real layout with columns and rows, you have to use nested flexbox, and sometimes nested and nested flexbox. And then if you want to move things on the website, you have to redo the HTML again, so it's not a good idea. And then CSS real layout spec appear, which allows you to debate the page in columns and rows and set how do you want they to be sized? How do you want they to grow or to shrink, depending on the space? And you can actually set a lot of, of different sizing behaviors for the, for the rows and the columns. And I have a complete layout. So it's like the solution that will be in the browser supported, I hope, soon. So first, let's talk about some grid concepts, in order that, because I'm going to use them during the talk, so in order that 
We all know what I'm talking about. This is a very simple grid with one row here, the column, the main, and the footer. And then the, maybe the most important concept regarding the CSS grid layout the spec are, are the grid lines because they are actually numbered. So they have, we have here three vertical lines, one, two, and three, and four horizontal lines, one, two, three, and four. And these numbers are really important because when you are placing elements on the grid, you are referencing these lines, actually. That's why they are starting one and not in zero to avoid confusion between rows and columns. We will see that later. But we are actually, if we want to put the header here in all this, we put it between the first and the third uh, vertical lines. Then we have the grid tracks, which are both the rows. In this case, we have three rows and the columns. We call the track both things the, independently on, on the direction. And then we have six cells in this, in this grid. But also, we can define grid areas that are, like for example, in this case, the first row completely. I can say that this is an area that takes two columns and is the whole first row. And I place directly the items inside that area. I can place one or three or two or several items inside that area, not, not specifically in a cell. So we will take a look to the syntax of, of grid, but only the basic things, because there are a lot of syntax and a lot of options to do the same things. And it's pretty power, powerful, but we will do just a quick overview of the syntax and the main features in order that you know how to use grid and you can start to play with them. And everything starts with a new value for the display property. In this case, it's display grid, so easy to remember. Similar to display flex, or there are also inline grid, like inline flex. And what happens when you use that is that if you put display grid to an element, that element becomes a grid container, and you are uh, setting a new formatting content. What does it mean? It means that you are breaking the flow of the page, so the children of the grid, which are the grid items, won't follow the regular flow of the, of the page, the regular layout, so they will have specific rules defined by the CSS grid layout spec. So we have two main properties to set the size, to set the structure of the grid, to set the size of the columns and the rows. We have grid template columns and grid template rows. They are long names, but not so hard to remember, I think. And the good part here is that we are actually creating boxes from CSS, which was not the, the, that common before. I mean, usually you need a wrapper element in the HTML, put it somewhere, and then you place things there. But here, from CSS, we are creating the containing boxes, and we are placing things there. So it's something a, a little bit new. So we are going to take a look at how, how this works. And actually, we have three different sizing methods, so sizing be behaviors for the, for the columns and the rows. We can use fixed sizes, like we put 100 pixels, 100 pixels, and 100 pixels. So we have three columns of 100 pixels, and we can even have a set the, the height of the rows. The second row can be bigger or whatever. We can remove one of the columns, and we have just two columns and two rows. And this is using fixed sizing. So we have another method that is using intrinsic sizing. So the columns or the rows will depend on the size of the contents. So we can put auto, for example. So we have this column now is as, as width as, as, the, as the content. If the, B, if the B has a 100 pixels width, we see that the column is bigger now. And the other option is use flexible sizing, which is, for example, this new unit, which is called free space. So we do one free, free space. So take the free space for the second column, or, or we do, can do, sorry. We can do similar things to the ones in Flexbox. So when you say to an item in Flexbox, flex grow one, flex grow two. So here is more or less the same. Use the free space, but you use double of the space than, than the second column. So these are mainly the three methods, and we will see later how, how they actually work. So now that we know how to create the structure of the grid, we have to place the elements there. So we have the grid placement properties. There are several shorthands, but 
the most common are grid column and grid row. And the important thing here is that when you are using a grid, you are actually, you are very easily breaking the order of, the, of your source code, of the, your HTML, the DOM order, and the visual order, because you can put here, put the items in different places of the page, and that will break that order. So you should keep a good order in your HTML in order that uh, for accessibility and in order that people using screen readers can follow that properly and, and don't mess, mess it up because of, you can change it later with, with these properties. So for example, we have here a grid of, with uh, two columns and two rows, and we can put the grid item in the second row, so it's just grid row two, and in the second column if we want, and you see that we are already breaking the order from the HTML and the visual order. We have also the order property like in Flexbox, but I don't know if it, it can be useful in some use cases, but not the most common thing, so. And then we can span the, the items, for example, say span two, so it will be taking two columns. And this is the same that saying from line one to line three, because we are actually referring lines here. So this is the second line, this is the first vertical line up to the third vertical line. And we can expand also vertically. So it will take two rows and two columns, or just one column, for example, the first or the second one. So we can very easily move things inside the, inside the grid with, with these properties. Also, Another interesting property is grid template areas that allow us to create named areas, so some places of the grid that we put name and name and we can place elements directly there. And it's a kind of ASCII art, as you, as you will say. So for example, we have here four items and we place the A in the head area, the main area, the nap area, and the foot area. And we are defining here the areas. So we have uh, the head taking the, the first row, the nap on the left, the mine on the right, and the foot taking the, the last row completely. But you can say, okay, but nap should be on the right better. And it could move to the right, and you can even say, but I want nap here too, and here too. And it changed, as you can see. So it allows you to, to do a lot of things and change very easily the layout of your web page, just modifying this simple property. You can even say that I prefer to have, have here a gap and don't, don't put any name to that, or have the head again, or, or whatever. So you have a lot of flexibility with this to just change how the layout of your web page is. Then, I've, I've, as you may, maybe have noticed it during my presentation, even if we don't set the, the grid play, placement properties like grid row and grid column, the elements are already taking the different cells on the on the grid. So that's because there is a, an algorithm and the auto placement feature that takes care of looking for empty cells on the grid in order to place the elements. And if you need to add more rows or more columns, that's controlled by grid auto flow property. So this is like the canonical example for auto placement feature. We have a very simple form with labels, input, label, input, and a button. And we say, okay, I want this to be a grid, so it's adding rows by default. If we say grid, auto flow, column, it will be adding columns, but we don't want that now. So let's stay with row, what, which is the default. So we can put the label on the first column. We put the inputs on the second column, and okay, the, the form is looking better, just putting it inside our grid, and we can say, okay, but the button can even spend two because we have enough space, we just have one button, so let's take the, the whole space, and we can even say, okay, justify self-center, and it's center now, we will see alignment just, just before, just next. So this is putting the elements, looking for empty cells, so the input goes here, here the, the level goes here, the input goes here, and then it has any row because there are no more space for, for the rest of the things, and it adds rows on demand. 
So alignment, and, and like, like we see this morning, in Flashbox, it was already very easy to uh, center things vertically and horizontally. And the same will happen with grid, because the same properties used, introduced by Flashbox, like justify items or justify self-align items, they, were also, they are also used in grid. And actually, they were gen like uh, the CSS working group created a new spec called CSS bo box alignment that is a generalization of the, of the things in Flashbox that also need grid. And grid is implementing and following that spec too. So it's very easy to to center things here. For example, just align items center and they are centered, and the same for justify, so they are centered too. And by default, the important thing is that they stretch by default vertically, like in Flashbox. So if this is the default behavior. If, if the row is bigger, like 200 pixels. It actually stretch anyway and, and takes the, the whole, if you don't set anything, if you say start, of course it doesn't stretch. But this is something quite different from what the regular blocks does, that usually take the whole space horizontally but not vertically. And then, uh, thanks to the grid spec, not because you use the grid spec you are going to do responsive designs by default, but it has some features that are very useful for, for helping you to create responsive websites. So one of them is the flexible track sizing for the, for the tracks, so they will take the space and they will grow and shrink depending on the, on the needs. And also if you combine it with media queries, you can very easily change the layout of your page. For example, just changing the grid template areas property. So here we have a, a grid with three rows and two columns, but if the width is smaller than 400 pixels, we go to just one column, for example, for mobile phones or whatever, or from portrait to landscape or something like that. So we can just change in this property, and you are also changing here the, the values for the, for the sizing of the rows and the columns. You are changing completely the layout of your web page, and you don't have to do anything with the HTML at all. You don't have to modify anything in the HTML. Just a few lines of CSS, and you will be changing the layout of your page, and you can even do more things. And the tracks that are flexible but are growing and shrinking as they, as they need. So that's more, most of the things that you can do nowadays with Grid. There are more syntax for doing the things. You can put names to the lines, but it's like a lot of stuff for, for this talk. So what about the future? There was a thing that was missing in, in CSS with layout spec that was the possibility to add gutters or, or gaps to the columns and the rows. So you have to do it manually before. You have to put, for example, if you want to have gaps of 25 pixels here, you have to put them manually on, on your columns. And then when you place the, the items, take care that you don't place them in the second column, which is actually a gap and place it on the third column. And there was a proposal to reuse column gap from multi-column spec and introduce a new property row gap. And actually, this week, the spec was modif modified, and these two properties have been added to the spec. They are not implemented yet, but <laughs> they will be soon. But also, me and while we don't have that, we also have the option, like a workaround using alignment, which is pretty similar to what you have with Flashbox. You have just a grid with three columns, but you are using justified content, space between, or space around. And this is similar to what we have in Flashbox. We are creating gaps. We don't know the size of the gap, but it's an option in some cases that can be nice. And another thing that will come, that will come in the future are subgrids, which is a bit complex to explain, but I will try it anyway. So, Basically, you can have a regular grid with, with several items, in this case, A, B, C, D, E, and then an, a new item that is a grid at the same time, so it's a nested grid. And in the nested grid, you place four items. But you are not sharing anything regarding the track sizing with, with your parent. So the alignment here is completely different. You don't know anything about your parent. The columns of your parents are bigger or smaller, or you don't know anything. So if you use subgrids, you will be sharing exactly the same lines than your parent. 
So the subgroup will be sharing the same track sizing information, so things might be perfectly aligned. So just in order to get the idea, if we have a real use, a more real form inside the UL and LI list, list items with the label and the input in, in each list item, we can say, okay, the UL is agreed, each list item is agreed at the same time, we put the labels on the first column, the inputs on the second, but this grid is independent of this grid, so they don't know anything about where to place, where are, what's the size of the first column in this grid and this grid, so they are not aligned at all. If we have the chance to use subgrid, which is not implemented yet, and is marked right now as at risk in the spec, so we will be probably move to the next level of the spec. We will have this perfectly aligned, so we could have something like, this is the main grid, and this is just our subgrid, so we place this like if they were children directly of the UL somehow. So now that we know more or less how all the syntax is and the features that we have, how does it work behind the scenes in the browser itself? What we have to implement in order that you, we can let out uh, a grid? Basically, we have to do three main steps somehow, very, very summarizing a lot the work we have to do, but we have to place the, the items inside the grid. So when you say grid row one, grid row two, grid column three, we have to place the items. We, if you don't set the properties, we have to run the auto-placement algorithm and look for empty cells and place them there. You can even place things outside of the grid and we add implicit tracks on demand. Then once they are placed, we have to calculate the size of the columns and the rows because they might depend on the content. And then once we know all the sizes, we have to lay out the items using the new containing boxes that they have defined by the grid. So we will, use, we will use this example to see how a grid works. So we have here five, five items. So then these two ones share the same class aside that put them in the third column but don't say anything about the row. And we have a grid with a width of 400 pixels to make easier the calculations. And we have uh, three columns. The first one has a fixed sizing method the other one flexible and the other intrinsic, just to see how all of them work. And also we have uh, two rows. So first of all, we have an empty grid. We know we have three, ro three rows and three columns and two rows thanks to these properties. But we don't know anything about the size of the rows or the columns at this point. So we start placing the items there. So the first item is title and we put it in the first row and the second column the nav on the second row and the first column, the main content on the second row and the second column, and then we have the add that has a class aside and it just says grid column three. So okay, the first row is empty, good for me. And add word, the first row was, not, was already take but add, so it has to go to the second row. So we have the elements placed inside the grid, and now we have to calculate the sizes of the columns and the rows. So first, the first column is very easy. We have a fixed sizing method, so it's 100 pixels. We don't have anything to calculate. But then, when we have processed all the fixed columns, we have to go to the intrinsic ones because they depend on the content, and the, the flexible ones that use the available space need to know the value of the others before. So we skip to the third column, which has auto, so this means that it needs to ask to each item inside that column, what's your size? So they say, okay, add, my size is 30 pixels. AdWords says, mine is 70 pixels. So auto column will be 70 pixels, like, like the, the biggest one of this. So they have, if you have like 100 rows, it will have to go to all the rows, to all the items in that column and calculate the sizes. And then we have the the column in the middle that was a flexible column, and now that we know the size of the rest of the things, we can, it just subtracts these values, and we have 230 pixels for, for this column. Okay, so we know the size of the columns, and now we have to lay out the items and say, okay, you have this width available for you, lay out you here, so title takes the width, and the content, maybe in this case is 
bigger, but we don't know the sizes of the row yet, so not, not important. But we need to calculate that this before going to the rows, because if the row depends on the content, we have to, we need to know these, these sizes. So the first row, again, is easy because it's a fixed row. So we just resize the thing. But the second row, which is auto again, has to, again to ask to the children. What's your height? OK, my, my height is 120 pixels. You are the bigger one. So we will go there. And it seems we are done. We have finished our, our grid, but not yet. Because as I told you before, the default option is, is a stretch. So they have to vertically stretch. So we have to lay out again the items and say, OK, you have to take the whole height of your containing boxes that are now these cells that we are defining in the grid. So now, yes, we are done. We have the grid layout. There was like a bunch of spe steps. And this is the most sim simple case, because if you have items spanning several rows or several columns, and the columns ha are intrinsic sizes or things like that, it becomes the, the algorithm is much, much more complex, and you have to do much more calculations. But anyway, you, you got the idea, more or less. And, and now that you know how it, it works, how can we make them faster? I mean, we can avoid some things or try to, to use different features to make the grids faster. And this is just some numbers that I took comparing some big grids with others and see what happens. So for example, as you can, this is very easily, very easy. I mean, fixed sizing is faster than using intrinsic sizing. If you have to ask, as you remember before, in the third column, we have to ask every children, what's your size? Before calculating the size of the column, if the column has a fixed sizing, that's, that's faster. Actually, in a 20 rows and 10 columns grid is 50% uh, faster. In a 100 times 20 grid, 100% 1 faster. And it's even 150% faster if the grid is bigger. So the bigger your grid is, the the, the biggest difference you are going to have here. But not, not only that, if we have, like the previous grid, uh, 20 rows and, and 10 columns grid, all of them are out, out, so they are intrinsic, or all of them are one affair, and they are flexible sizing, so taking the free space. Auto is faster because the flexible sizing, you have to divide the space to calculate, and the division operation is pretty expensive. So on average, auto in this case is 70% faster. So it's better if you can use fixed sizing. Otherwise, it's better if you can use intrinsic. Of course, if it's just one column with flexible sizing, it's not a big deal. But if you are doing the whole grid with flexible sizing, it's much, much more complicated. And also, as you remember, the last step was a stretch, and lay out the items again to stretch them vertically and take the whole space. So if you avoid a, a stretch, you are saving time. Actually, you are, a stretch is 20% slower than using a start or center or, or end, for example. And that's because we need to do that extra step later. Also, if you use fixed sizes for your items, they are not going to stretch. So you are saving this time anyway. So that's all about the spec and how does it work and how, what's the current status of the, of the things. Nowadays, so basically, uh, the W3C specification is here. This is the link to the editor's draft because it's evolving. And the last working draft is from from March, but since then, a few syn syntax have changed. For example, in the grid template areas, for the the gaps, you can use several dots now, and not only one. If you want to have everything aligned. Also, the grid name areas, the grid name lines, syntax that we didn't see also changes. So the spec is evolving. Um, and the last syntax and the last things that we have implemented are on the editor's draft. And this spec was started back in the times of Windows 8 and Internet Explorer 10 by Microsoft. But since then, it has evolved a lot and have much more features, and the syntax has changed, changed it a lot. And it's a very good timing for this kind of talk because you are going to be the ones using grid in the future, so you can already start playing with it 
and see if you miss features because the spec is still moving. So you still are still on time of talking with the CSS working group and saying, okay, but I'm missing this. That is really important for us. And then uh, we are, Igal is working on the W3C test suite, which is just a bunch of HTML, a small HTML pages with some CSS and some JavaScript sometimes. So any of you could contribute there. For example, if you want, you go to the spec, you want to test a few features, and you create several small, small HTML files testing the different options. And you do a, a GitHub pull request, and we can, I can review that, and we can integrate it in the, in, inside the test suite. So the test suite is really interesting for us to find bugs, but not only for fi to find bugs, because in order that the rest of the browsers implement the spec, if they have a test suite for reference and to check that they are following the spec properly, it's really nice, and also for us to be sure that we are following the spec properly. So that's maybe the bad part. Can I use grids? If you go to the page, you see that it's not ready yet. But that's not exactly how things are, because my talk is called CSS Read Layout. It's just around the corner, so it's not, not that bad, I think. Basically, in, in Internet Explorer, since version 10, you can use it. Not the same syntax, not all the features, but you can create grids. They are prefixed with MS. And actually, in, the, in Microsoft Edge, it will keep the old implementation yet, so they, they are not updating the, the implementation yet because the spec is still moving. Then, in Chrome, you can find the, the implementation that is more complete and that it is more updated. For example, the last changes that happened during the last month on the syntax are already implemented there. There are some web kits, so, and it's our primary focus for our work. We are working mostly on, on Blink, and all the patches go first to Blink. And you can test this behind the experimental web platform feature flag. You just enable the flag, and you can test this in your Chrome. I'm using Chrome Canary, actually, in this presentation, and I'm using a lot of reads. Then on WebKit, uh, so when we do the patches, we work mostly on Blink, but then we move them to WebKit because the code is pretty similar, and it's very straightforward for us to have both, both implementation ongoing at the same time. And it's useful because sometimes we find bugs on the WebKit side, and then we solve them both in, in the both projects. And it's like a feedback between both projects. And it's enabled by default in the night list, but in this case, it's prefixed with, with WebKit. So if you want to test this, you can download the night list, but you have to use prefix. And basically, we don't know anything about the plans of Safari, about Chromium. We, our plan is, our goal is to ship the feature this year, but we depend also on what the spec, if the spec keeps moving a lot or not. So it's not that easy to, to give an estimated date, but we hope that during this year we are sending the intent to ship to the Blink developer list and see what, what's going on there. And I guess that once that's ready, the implementation in WebKit is lagging a bit behind, but should be should be ready to, in, in like in a few months later, so I hope Safari will ship too. And then in Firefox, the implementation has just started this year, and it's also behind a flag, and you can do simple grids, but it still needs more work. But there is also a polyfill that you can, that is in under development, and you can use to play with reading other browsers if you need it. So it's not, like you can use it already, but you can already start playing with it and provide feedback in order that once this is shipped, it will be much more complicated to change things. Or So it's better to test it before. So if you want to test it, we have a repository with examples on GitHub. This is very simple with just when we implement the feature, we upload a few examples just in case some, someone wants to take a look to it. And Rachel Andrew, who is giving a lot of talks about CSS Build layout and explaining very well all the syntax, and knows much more than us how to write websites and how to do websites, because she is not an implementer of a browser like us, has a nice website with a lot of examples and more real use cases, so you can take a look too. And last, I would like to publicly thank Bloomberg, because we are in a collaboration with, with them, working on that, and without their support, nor neither the spec, neither the implementation will be in the situation it is now, because we are actually helping to move the spec forward, and, and the implementation is, 
is covering almost everything that is in the spec right now, so it's very ready, and, and we are really happy to do, to do that. And that's all from my side. Thank you very much for listening. And we can talk with me later. <laughs>